This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only and is not meant to be considered medical advice for any particular patient. Clinicians must rely on their own informed clinical judgments when making recommendations for their patients. Patients in need of medical advice should consult their personal health care provider. From UPMC Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, welcome to That's Pediatrics. I'm Brian Martin, Vice President of Medical Affairs here at Children's. I'm Carolyn Coyne. I'm a scientist in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases. Joining us today is Andrew Bugert, who joins us from the Division of Pediatric Hospital Medicine. He arrived here at uh, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh in 2009 after completing his pediatric residency at Children's of Alabama. Since that time, he has assumed a major role in the oversight and expansion of quality improvement and high value clinical care within the Children's Hospital, as well as for the entire UPMC graduate medical education program. Thank you for joining us today, Andrew. Absolutely, thank you. So normally I like to start with a little bit of background. Tell us a little bit about sort of yourself, your training, maybe what brought you to to Children's, um, as well as maybe what brought you to your specialty. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. So I, I grew up in North Carolina, and as you mentioned, did my residency at uh, Children's of Alabama and Birmingham at uh, UAB and uh, the Children's Hospital down there. And I knew during my training that I was very interested in patient safety, quality improvement, and, and um, as a part of my role, pursuing administrative work in those areas in addition to my clinical work, and even use some of my elective time to do some electives with our chief medical officer at uh, the Children's Hospital. And so um, at the time when I was finishing my residency, um, pediatric hospital medicine was really in its infancy. I believe there were four fellowships in the country, and uh, none, none of them were really official fellowships. They were all grant-supported, and um, there were a lot of questions about, you know, how, how sustainable was that going to be, although I was hoping it would be quite sustainable. But I got really good advice from some of my faculty mentors that I ought to find a place for my first faculty position that would, had been doing this for a very long time in terms of pra- practicing hospital medicine and pediatrics and had a lot had senior faculty who could provide a lot of mentorship in addition to younger folks like myself who were early in their career. And so that's really how I found um, Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh and now UPMC Children's. Um, I had actually never even thought about Pittsburgh when I was looking for residency and not sure even as a kid that I knew Pittsburgh existed um, or where it was and uh, happened to find um, the group here. And there were folks who had been practicing pediatric hospital medicine long before they knew that they were hospitalists and came up here and met them. Basil Zatelli was one of them and Sarah McIntyre and Andy Erbach and um, discovered that not only were they great mentors for pediatric hospital medicine, but there was also a lot of opportunity for mentorship around growing my experience with patient safety and quality improvement and other administrative work. And so uh, it just it was absolutely the right place to, to come to. And uh, Pittsburgh's a great city, and it's a wonderful place to live. And uh, all those things worked out, and, and here I am and absolutely love it. If you don't mind me asking a very basic question, as I sort of in my introduction alluded to, I'm a basic scientist. Uh, What is pediatric hospital medicine? Sort of what is that as a specialty? I don't know that I'm exactly familiar on the specifics. Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I think of it as my job as a hospitalist in pediatrics is to take care of children and young adults who are admitted to the hospital for all sorts of reasons. Generally, uh, this falls into children and young adults who were previously healthy and got sick with something or had something happen that um, they need to be in the hospital for more evaluation or more workup. And then also children and young adults who at baseline have a lot of medical complexity and a lot of things going on who also may be sick with something acute or something that is more chronic and and needs more evaluation. And so um, as a hospitalist, I really think of it as I'm the captain of the ship, and a big part of my job is working very closely with our subspecialist consultants who can focus in on their individual areas where I can see the the big picture. And it's interesting because it actually ties in nicely, I think, to um, the opportunities of quality improvement and patient safety. I think as hospitalists, we really are uniquely positioned to be able to do this type of work because we do. We focus on the big picture. We focus on coordination of care. We focus on communication between the subspecialists and really putting the pieces together and communicating those pieces to the patient and the family in a way that that, that makes sense, that they can understand, and um, driving what direction we go in a way that makes sense from the complexity that our subspecialists are experts in. Interesting. Command central, so to speak. (laughs) That's a very good way to put it. I like that. Andrew, I'd love to to take a 
uh, go down the rabbit hole a little bit about quality and safety. So, you know, as a hospitalist, we sort of defined what that is in your role there. Can you speak a little bit about how you have furthered um, your knowledge base and in turn helped us elevate a culture of safety uh, and quality here at uh, Children's Hospital Pittsburgh? Yes. So, you know, when I was getting started in this work, I think that it was something that most of us who were doing it at the time really learned it by doing. And we're very fortunate that since that time, we've, we've been able to accumulate a large body of, um, uh, of of education and resources that can really help us to then teach these skills to, to others. But it, it, it comes down to really recognizing where there is opportunity for improvement. And in healthcare, there is a lot. And I think particularly as, as frontline physicians, we absolutely see those opportunities for improvement. We see where things could could go better, should have gone better, or maybe something went really well but really was not the standard approach, and we want to learn from that. And I think that leads to how can we fix this problem? How can we make sure that this hole in the Swiss cheese does gets, gets plugged so that uh, bad things can't happen? Or how do we learn from this opportunity where things went really well and actually make that the standard? And so uh, that, that leads leads to, to quality improvement and re- leads to recognition of the safety opportunities that can be fixed with quality improvement. And now we have a, a lot of opportunity for our learners, as well as our, our faculty as well, to better understand these concepts of how we effectively do a quality improvement project. But I think most importantly, it really comes down to recognition. And that's actually one of the areas that we are really focusing in on and have been both here at Children's and throughout UPMC with our residents and interns and fellows, that opportunity to recognize where things could go better, where we could do something better. I think that our residents and, and interns and fellows who truly are our frontline physicians and are in, in the trenches every day, they see these opportunities, they see these challenges, they're on the phone trying to solve a problem, and then the next day they're on the phone trying to solve the exact same problem again, and their, their colleagues are doing it, and they, they're talking about it, and really what we're trying to help them to recognize, and this is what got me started in this as well, is recognizing that this is not something that we should consider as just normal or par for the course of, of practicing medicine in such a complex era, these are opportunities for us to recognize that we can make this better. And we really want to, as I sort of used to say, turn your gripes into changes. It really helps us to recognize where there's an opportunity to improve the system and improving the system leads to better and safer care for all of our patients. And so we've really been very focused on helping our frontline physicians, our residents and fellows and interns to recognize that. And, and I think one of the major opportunities that we also have is that um, they recognize these, but we as an institution, we as a hospital, and we as an institution have to empower them to speak up about this. We have to let them know that this is a safe space, this is a safe environment, and your ideas are great ideas, and you you may need a little bit of help from us as leaders to um, implement the solution or to figure out the best solution that's going to work, but we want to hear where these opportunities are because if we don't hear about it, we can't start addressing it, and we really want to hear your ideas, and we want to help you to work on improving these, these ideas. And I, I guess I have maybe a two-part question um, that I somewhat linked is that, you know, you're talking a lot about like the challenges and I'm wondering if you can kind of provide examples of, of what those challenges are. And then sort of a follow-up to that would be, are there sort of unique challenges within patient care, within pediatrics that perhaps in non-pediatric sort of either hospital uh, hospitals or networks that they don't face quite as much? Hmm. You know, I think communication and coordination is always a great example of challenges. And one of the one of the things that I think we see a lot, at, particularly as hospitalists, although I think we probably see it on our subspecialty services and our surgical services as well, is the ability to coordinate the right care happening for the patient while they're acutely ill and happening in, in, in the right place in the right time. And um, we often find that there are challenges where we know that a patient may need to have something done, but to get that to that point where that where all the components that go into doing that, such as obtaining a sedated MRI at the right time, the components of having all of that happen or having a certain procedure done, um, coordinating all of that can can be difficult and is often something that falls on the uh, least experienced physicians, uh, the, the interns and residents to, to sort through. And it's a great opportunity where we can work to try to build a process to make that, to make that go more 
more smoothly. Um, I don't think that's that's unique to pediatrics in any way whatsoever. I think particularly in pediatrics, um, one, one of the areas of opportunity that we have is with our communication back to our primary care providers. We're fortunate that in pediatrics, um, almost all of our patients, and for the most part, I would say all of them do because of the um, school requirements, all of our patients really do have a primary care provider. But we often are very siloed away from the primary care provider. And what happens here often is not effectively communicated back to the primary care provider, or we, um, as 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 academic physicians, um, feel that we're going to approach this fresh and we don't really need to know what was what the primary care provider was thinking about or doing and we can just start from scratch and we really need to work better to better coordinate that and so I think in the particularly in the pediatric world we we have a really good infrastructure where patients have primary care providers and they have the ability for care to truly be on the continuum and we have a great infrastructure that we can figure out how we improve that communication so that the care is seamless and, and even an extension of that that I, I think is also unique to pediatrics is the opportunity to engage other uh, folks who provide care to patients who may not necessarily be their primary care providers, so school nurses. And we're doing a lot of work here at UPMC Children's to better engage our school nurses in the care of patients with, with chronic uh, can, with chronic diseases such as asthma and diabetes and figure out how that school nurse who really knows that patient day in and day out and sees that child in school and has tremendous opportunity to help the, the patient to stay as healthy as possible, how we can engage them in, in doing that and empower them to do that and, and also communicate effectively with them. So I think that's that that is unique to pediatrics, but it's a huge opportunity that we have to capitalize on to keep our kids as healthy as possible. A few minutes ago, you mentioned a word that I really liked, and that was learners. Um, the way that you described, I think everyone in an academic um, patient care environment as a learner, I thought I thought was fantastic. Can you speak to how does this generation of medical students and residents And uh, what is their experience like that's different from yours back when you trained in regards to safety culture and education and mistake prevention and uh, and communication, which is, uh, you you know, as you just said, is really foundational. You know, coordination and communication are foundational for for safe environments uh, for patients and families. Can you speak like how are they, you know, an incoming intern right now um, in 2020? How is it different than it was 10 or so years ago? Yeah, it's vastly different. I, I think that our medical students and certainly our incoming interns and residents are coming to us with experience in patient safety and quality improvement. They are learning this in medical school. They are learning some of the fundamental building blocks of recognition of opportunities for improvement and even some of the more complex aspects of how do you do a QI project and what's a run chart and how do you uh, display the data in a way that you can publish it and present it. And they're coming to us with this. And And they have underlying knowledge about how they can improve the system, which is very different than when I was in medical school. I don't think I learned anything about that. And uh, um, even even in my residency, we were just beginning to figure out ways that we would be able to learn as residents and and teach our our co-residents about this type of work, which um, was actually one of the opportunities that I had as a resident uh, to start thinking about that in my own program at the time. Um, Nowadays, since they're coming into us with, with with the tools and a lot of the background, I think that even more so tells us that as an institution, as a hospital, as an as a, um, institution, and as faculty, physicians, and as leaders, we all absolutely must empower our residents and fellows and medical students to actually tell us where they see these opportunities and to really empower them to be able to work on these projects because they are, they're coming to us with the, with the ideas that they know how to do this and the opportunity that they bring to us as well is that they come in with fresh eyes. They're coming from other places or they're just so new that they're seeing our processes that we see day in and day out and they're recognizing where we have opportunity. And so um, they are so well positioned now to help us to improve that we absolutely have to listen to them and we have to support them and we have to make sure that they know that we are are completely listening to their ideas and and are um, excited and thankful that they're helping us with it and we want to work together with them as we work to improve the system. So I think we're in a really good place with where our for our new physicians and our students are coming to us with this knowledge. And we really have to make sure that we are supportive of this opportunity. 
And I mean, do you think some of this is, is obviously, you know, you mentioned the enthusiasm maybe that kind of the the younger generation, if you will, is coming in with. Um, and do you think that's kind of the key to really making progress, right? That, if you know, basically when people are coming into residency or internship or sort of early on that, you know, everyone is within a culture of, you know, wanting to be better, but then also having more senior leadership sort of opening, you know, open to suggestions and being better. I mean, presumably that's how we sort of, you know, make the culture shift that, that everyone's leaning or are going towards um, in terms of like improvement would do you think that that's the case or oh completely yeah exactly and um, you know it, it, we ha- we have the opportunity that every single year we have a whole new group of fresh eyes and, and fresh faces coming in to to begin doing um, our culture change and in fact I remember um, when I first came here uh, back in 2009 and I think that we had two event reports in our hospital that were filed by physicians and the following year after we started talking about it we doubled that we had four event reports filed by our resident physicians and now we routinely see 40 to 50 of our event reports per month that are filed by our residents here at Children's. And we're, we were very quickly, after a few years, got to the point where for our third year residents, they didn't know any different. All they knew was that absolutely you recognize an event and you file an event report because they weren't here when that was not the norm. And so it's a great opportunity for us to change culture because we have groups coming in and very quickly within a year or two, they learn that culture and they teach it to the new incoming group. And within a, a year, we have a whole cycle where the culture has completely changed and allows us to have that rapid growth. So it's, it, it, we're actually very fortunate, particularly in academic medicine, that we do have that opportunity. There aren't too many industries where you have so many new new faces coming in every single year who can really help to learn that new culture and then it quickly becomes the only culture that they know so it's a tremendous opportunity Andrew I'd love to hear about that that culture evolution the way that you're describing it um, can you so I guess sort of a two-part here as well uh, what excites you about the future in terms of uh, in terms of furthering this type of quality the, the quality work that we do here and then, um, and they, these things are probably going to be intertwined in some ways. Um, analytic capability within hospitals has evolved tremendously since the advent of the EHR, you know, coming up on 20 plus years ago now. Uh, can you speak a little bit about how analytics uh, informs our work and, and helps us drive uh, and sort of helps us drive positive change here at UPMC Children's? Yeah, I was going to say that you read my mind when you added the analytics part of it, because I think that's really the answer to the first question as well, that the future really is that we are adding in analytics and our uh, medical students and our residents are so used to living in a world where just. Dis- support is just a part of what we do. We all do it every day with our with our devices and our computers. And um, we're, we're so used to that, that as we've evolved that, that technology to be able to provide um, data analytics, both behind the scenes that can help us to understand populations better, as well as at the point of care that can help with decision making, I think that our new um, culture of our, of, of our learners is, is completely embracing that and, and using that to provide the best care. And I think that really is where the tremendous opportunity that's on the horizon is, is that we are going to have from from our current learners all sorts of fresh ideas of new ways to take care of patients and new ways to approach the settings of care, new ways to um, di- diagnose diseases and, and, and figure out the best um, way to treat them along the continuum. And our analytics technology is going to assist us with that and help us with that. And I think the two absolutely are intertwined. And that really is, I think, the culture change that now it is becoming just a part of what we do. And we've opened up that door to continue to accelerate the the growth with analytics to to be able to use analytics and technology to provide the best care of patients and keep our population of patients as healthy as possible. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining us, Andrew. This was fantastic. Thank you. Really appreciate it, Andrew. Thanks again. Absolutely. Thank you. You can find other episodes of That's Pediatrics on iTunes, Google Play Music, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to keep up with new content. Leave a review and tell us what other topics you'd like our experts to cover. Thank you for listening.